Welcome to Shooting Spaces, a real estate photography podcast. Discussions on gear, technique, industry news, and interviews with the best in the business. Now, here are your hosts, Rich Baum and Brian Berkowitz. Hello and welcome to Shooting Spaces. I'm Brian from New York. And this is Rich Baum from Sacramento, California. And we want to thank you for tuning in for another fantastic (laughs) episode with an incredible guest today. But before we get into it, as we usually do, Rich, how is your day and what's going on with you? My day is great. The smoke of Northern California has subsided and I guess it's it's going up and over uh, over Washington into Canada. So we have clear skies, which is good because I have a twilight shoot tonight. But um, everything is just great, man. I'm doing uh i did a couple of designer shoots which were a super nice change from real estate and i use my air quotes real estate photography but uh things are going well and and how about you what you up to uh things are good i had a very busy day today i shot three properties in manhattan so i was running all over the place but Cool story is, uh, you know, a fellow real estate photographer from Australia, Peter Berzanskis, reached out to me. Um, You might know him from some of the groups. He happened to be in New York today, and he wanted to know if I was around uh, or doing on any shoots. He wanted to join me. So he came out on uh, some of my shoots today and joined me and helped out, and we got to chat. And, uh, you know, I spent all day chatting with another real estate photographer from Australia so and a listener. So it was pretty awesome. That sounds great. Fantastic. And running all over the place, the New York City hustle. Oh, awesome. And on that note, Rich, why don't you tell us who we have today? Because I know you um, have prior experience with this photographer and know him personally, and I will let you make the intro. So, Oh, Brian, thank you so much. Um, today's guest is really um, kind of dear to my heart because he was one of my participants at my workshops in uh, the the workshops I was doing with Mark Weisberg in Southern California. And um, it's turned out to be somebody I followed and watched. And I feel like I've seen him grow to the potential that he is capable of. And it just has blown my mind. Um, We have today a photographer that lives in the deserts of California, but he lives in the deserts of California, which has really, really expensive properties. So he has a really great opportunity to uh, photograph these great, great um, listings, but he's also incorporating great drone photography and he's incorporating all this great technology and in equipment and he's doing fantastic video work. And his name is Chris Miller. And I just want to introduce Chris Miller and to say, please, Chris, tell us your name, tell us where you're from and tell us your website. Thanks, Rich. Uh, Chris Miller. Uh, I live in uh, La Quinta, California, Palm Springs area, and my website business name is Imagine Imagery. It's a terribly annoying name, especially when you're trying to, uh, <laughs> you know, tell somebody I have to type it in over the phone. But as you guys know, it's kind of hard to find a web address that's not already taken. Yes, we know that all too well. <laughs> but um, just for the listeners that do want to listen or check out your work while they're listening, just if you can quickly just spell that out, because as you said, it's a little bit of a tongue twister. My uh, my current work is really on Instagram, and it's Imagine Imagery. I M A G I N E I M A G E R Y. Boy, that is hard to say. I'm telling you, that's annoying. But you're stuck with it, so you're going to go with it. <laughs> Yeah, that's part of the thing. We should do a whole podcast on how do you name your website. So. It's tough. Hey, yeah. Rich, I want to know, you contacted me this morning, uh, you know, last minute. I'm going to uh-huh. be on the show. So I just want to know um, who your first choice was, who I'm filling in for. Oh, Chris, you are always. <laughs> no, no, I'll get out of this, Brian. I'll get out of this. Chris, you are my number one choice. And because I have a whole list. And, and as soon as everybody else canceled, you were my number one choice. <laughs> Dude, so, no, we just, you know what? Here's the situation. Sometimes Brian and I are so busy, especially this time of year. It's tough to try and really, in advance, um, line up people to to be worthy or just, you know, and, and no joke, joke jokes aside, but just to be worthy of uh, something interesting for people. And I really think that you are are perfect for people that are not just starting out, but people that are trying to get their business together, trying to make good decisions on directions to go. And Chris, 
to me, looking after meeting you and, and learning about you and working with you, you have made all the right choices. It, apparently, uh, at least on Facebook and watching your your um, all your other lines of, of uh, information, Instagram and such, but you really have done it. So I just want to commend you and to, uh, you know, go from there. Thanks, man. And all kidding aside, I'm really grateful to be here and have the opportunity to do this. I had to go to Best Buy today to buy a <laughs> microphone to speak in and any excuse to go spend money at Best Buy is, is good yeah. enough for me. <laughs> well, you've got no, a lot seriously, of excuses. seriously, thanks, Rich. You get a lot of excuses because I see it all the time. I mean, you just in, you just purchased a whole new set of lights which is one thing I want to talk about because it's very interesting, the technology, but you, you've recently, I think you've recently got a Ronin and just little things like that. So I want to say that they're all really great excuses of, uh, of in, including into your, your package, but tell us, uh, have all these investments worked out to um, money wise, have they worked out and do you, Maybe not at this moment, but have you felt that it is a good investment in the future? Uh, yeah, I, I do, but I, I have a hard time thinking of gear as an investment. Um, it, it's more a matter of convenience. Like, you know, when we look at anybody's work, we can't tell if they used a Pro Photo flash or a Godox flash or a Canon camera, a Nikon camera. It actually doesn't really matter. And yeah. I know, yeah. you know, there's so many people that, that kind of think that it does, but you know, lights, light, all the sensors are about the same. Yeah. What it comes down to for me is fortunately I've been successful enough to be able to try different brands of equipment, different, uh, flash systems, different camera systems. And for me, what it is like, uh, I think you had seen, I got a, a small Nissan kit cause I came out with that MG 10 which is kind of like an AD200, but it's it's in the shape of a handle. You know, it's got a trigger on it, so you can trigger the camera from the flash, which is it's, a neat way for us to work. Obviously. It's so so cool. Your video uh, in the groups was so cool. I think uh, Brian, we have to put that link in our show notes because it's a really cool piece of kit. And and that really, you know, that kind of summarizes this theory that I have that it, it doesn't matter. It's not about like, I wasn't getting good enough light out of my Nikon mm -hmm. speed lights. I wasn't getting quite enough light out of them. Uh, or, you know, I've got a set of Godox AD200s, which are awesome. You know, I could shoot anything with those. Um, and this MG10 doesn't put out any better light. But for me, it's more comfortable mm -hmm. to hold. It's more fun because you actually literally point it like a gun and pull the trigger. You know, the kid in me, you know, thinks I, I enjoy shooting it with, with it more. It doesn't give any better or different light. It's just sometimes the gear, like a carbon fiber tripod, do you need that? No. I'm going to carry that thing around for sometimes 12 to 14 hours a day, loading it in and out of the car four or five times a day, five days a week or six days a week <laughs> if I'm lucky, you know, day in and day out. That extra $200, you know, to get the carbon fiber tripod, is that help my business does that make me any more money no i spent a little money on it but it's a matter of yeah. comfort uh experience the whole experience like i have to load and lug and charge and sink and build and collapse and pack and unpack this stuff multiple times a day i want the the most efficient comfortable equipment to work with and that mg10 is a good example like i said it just doesn't give any better light it's just a little more pleasurable to work with if i got to press that hold that thing and press that button 10 or 12 hours a day every day i want to enjoy it as much as possible wow you know but it's the small little things and rich has said this multiple times um time is money and even these small little things that save you a couple seconds or you know uh, some muscle strain here and there that all adds up 
minutes. So, you know, if it saves you a couple minutes here or, you know, the, the aluminum versus carbon fiber tripod, you know, you can load it in and out quicker or you're not as, as stressed carrying all that heavy gear. You know, it's, it's worth the investment. You know, that's one of the biggest mistakes I made. I have an aluminum tripod and I didn't spend on the carbon fiber and my next one will be a carbon fiber. But today I was in the city shooting all over Manhattan and I took a train into Manhattan, took subways from one location to the second to the third and i was lugging my aluminum tripod all over with me and you know it's exhausting at the end of the day yeah it's um it's it's really just a matter of comfort and convenience you know you see so many newcomers on the forums talking about that like oh you got to have this or you know telling a newcomer he needs the the 14 to 24 2.8 you know the thing that weighs four and a half pounds because it's got all this incredible huge glass that'll never use and you know that kind of stuff I get a little pet peevy about it, you know, um, but any pretty much, you know, the work that we do, Brian, you do fantastic work, Rich, you do fantastic work. And the truth is, y'all know, we could do that with a, a crop camera and a couple speed lights. If we have to. It's, not, yeah. it's not really about the equipment. It's just a, it's a matter of comfort and convenience is the way I see it. Hmm. Well, I want to say too, my, in, in regards to what you just said, the, ease of, of performance or, or the simplify your life. When I went to a geared head, I started going for the Manfrotto 410, which was, i be honest with you, after a while, my fingers were, it was hard to turn. And then I went to the 405 and it was much easier. And I eventually went to the Arca Swiss D4, which I don't tell anybody to go buy, you know, a thousand dollar head. But it sure made my life easier because it was just so much in, more enjoyable to turn easy knobs and to get the same, if not better, performance. So yeah, I could do it with, with a ball head, but I choose the D4. So same thing. That's it. I went through the same uh, thing. Well, I started oh, with that's the, right. You have the one. You have I the D4 too. The, <laughs> I started with the 410, and after I got that, the D4 you know it's like is that worth a thousand dollars more it depends on how you look at it you know it's a it's it doesn't make my work a thousand dollars better that's for sure it never had and it never will it makes you know made my last month you know a thousand dollars more enjoyable not to twist <laughs> those hard sticky knobs all you know all day long every day hey chris let me ask you a question since we're on this topic and i don't think we've ever really covered it from a um a user's perspective why do you use a geared head? Well, it's really about the the verticals and the lines, you know, the, f for me. Um, you can get straight lines with a ball head, and it, it's just more time-consuming, less efficient uh, to be able to hold that ball in place uh, and try to twist it just when you're holding it just right. Uh, the geared head allows, you know, holds the camera still while you make those fine adjustments watching the watching the screen or the viewfinder to get to fine tune the composition without having to do that balancing ball head act, you know. And again, it's it's a matter of efficiency and convenience, really. And precision. And really, precision, sure. Which yeah. is so key in what we do. Brian, what do you think about uh, what head are you using and what do you think about it? I'm using the 410, uh, the 410, and I'm right at that point now where it's starting to um, take its toll on me, and I'm about to upgrade. Um, like you said, your hands are starting to hurt, and I'm kind of there right now. Um, now that I've been shooting like crazy the last few weeks, um, you know, the thing I, I think I need to upgrade to. And, but yeah, for me, the geared head is just about being able to make those micro adjustments that you cannot do with any other type of head. You know, if, if I'm using a ball head and I need to, you know, pan my camera one or two degrees, like there's no way I can do that perfectly with a mm -hmm. ball head. It's just not going to happen. Um, well, with a geared head, if you if you need, you know, an eighth of an inch to just pan a little bit to the right, like you have that capability. So it's the, you know, the ability to make those micro adjustments, which is, is huge for me in clutch. For a good uh, analogy, I, I, uh, I think with the, comparing the Manfrotto 410 geared head to the Arca Swiss D4, which is uh, Rich and I's favorite. It's kind of like <laughs> the 410 is like a car that doesn't have power steering. And if your first car didn't have power steering, it seems normal and it feels fine. It turns left, it turns right. No problem with it, right? But then someone puts you in a car, the first time you drive a car with, a, with powered steering is kind of like what it's like 
you know, using the D4 the first time, you turn the knobs, you're like, oh my gosh, this is actually really nice and easy to turn. Oh yeah, Chris. That's that analogy is exactly why I wanted you on the on the podcast. So uh, thank you. No, it's exactly. It's just more. You know what? We all spend so much time moving our knobs of our tripod head, and just to make it easier and better, it really does boil down to. I'm so glad you came on and said it's all about making our day better. Sure, you can do the same thing with a. You can do it with a pistol grip, with a, a ball head, but it's so much more enjoyable to do. Okay. A if you got head. a whole car, you drive on Saturdays. You know, it's not that big a deal. You know, you, it's kind of a. <laughs> it's a thing. You know, it's like getting nostalgic. You know, but if it's a car you drive every day. Yeah. Uh, they put 80 miles a day on it, you know, 12 hours a day, you yeah. want the power steering, you know, go ahead and <laughs> go ahead and pony up for the power steering. I think everybody should invest in Arca Swiss, um, uh, stocks because there's going to be a few people buying them. But, yeah. <laughs> I see I'm, I'm due for a big investment this fall and, um, Toying with the Arca Swiss with the D4 or going with the 17 millimeter tilt shift. Get, um, both, get is, both. both is not happening. <laughs> well, both is not happening now. Not yet. <laughs> but um, unless you want to make a donation to my uh, gear fund. Wait, we put that out <laughs> but, there uh, for GoFundMe, Brian Berkowitz. <laughs> exactly. I, I need a new head and a, and a tilt shift. <laughs> but I actually think I'm going to go with the tilt shift first and then. Um, next year, we'll have to upgrade to the. Listen, I want to just, um, you know, a lot of what I wanted to talk to you about, Chris, was equipment because you really are, you're like a geek like me. And we all just are only geeky just to try and make our lives better and easier. Yes, you you nailed it, where you could get the same quality from a full, full frame or a crop sensor, or you can get the same thing from a ball head or a geared head. But it's about your enjoyment. <laughs> So let's just move off that for a second. And Chris, I'd like to ask you about your business and how, what you have done to maybe uh, where you were getting into it and where you have, were in the middle and where, you're, where you've become and where you're going. So let me ask you about your business. Uh, sure. It's been an incredible evolution, actually. Uh, I've been... Uh, I haven't had to real, get a real job for about going on 12 years now, um, <laughs> but it's, it's changed. I mean, I started out shooting weddings um, and I don't really shoot a lot of weddings anymore. I'll do a odd one here and there on a, on a great referral. Um, and that kind of morphed into, uh, I love photographing landscape. That was my journey in photography started with landscape photography. And then I parlayed that into golf course photography, which is, I like to refer to as landscapes with a budget, you know, <laughs> uh, and then, and this is over a course of 12 years. I'll try to summarize it as quickly as possible. So then I was shooting for these, uh, shooting golf courses for these, uh, you know, country clubs out here in the desert mostly. And then the, the general manager of the club said, Hey, we got a new chef and he's got these new items. Can you photograph some food for us? And cause your golf course photos are so pretty. And I'd lied and said I could. And I went home and Googled, you know, how to photograph food and uh, wrecked that miserably, you know, for a year or two until I figured it out. And the same thing happened with real estate. I was doing a lot of uh, a lot of uh, beauty shots for this beautiful country club out here in the desert. And they have a, uh, an in-house uh, realty uh, agency. And they asked me to start shooting photos. And this was, I don't know, eight years ago, probably. And. I had some strobes because I was shooting some commercial portraiture and that type of thing. Um, but my business was all over the place. Like, you know, I didn't have a, a niche or a genre. I would do, you know, whatever anybody would pay me to take pictures of. I'd try to figure out how to do it. And so anyway, I got a lot of relatively a lot of work. I mean, I was probably shooting a couple of houses a week and I was doing them. I knew I had to light them. That's the tricky thing about, uh, the area that I'm in, this beautiful desert, all of the homes, or most of them, especially the high-end ones, they have these big, huge, and maybe the entire rear of the home is glass, you know, because it's all about the view. So I've, I was perplexed and challenged for years. I was lighting the homes to try to balance the, the 
dark wooden interior with this big bright desert sky on the outside and never doing a great job at it for for years and never really figured out how to do that uh until i met you rich actually you're the one that taught me how to do that and uh i think that was probably that's probably been a year ago um since uh my my post rich career are you talking about the uh, the famous darken mode yeah all of it uh flambian <laughs> really i mean i hate to use the word flambian i know some people oh, knock don't it. no don't say that man. <laughs> but i i gotta give i gotta give credit where credit's due man i didn't invent crit flambian i didn't even make the name up thank god because people are r- r- ripping on flambian but i certainly didn't do the darken mode and that was uh uh my my good friend, um, uh, we have Wayne, Peter right? Ly- well, Peter Lyons told me on the phone as I'm driving and I'm almost crashed my car because it was like a <laughs> light bulb moment going, oh, my God, that's so great. But I think it all came from Wayne and Wayne probably learned it from somebody like uh, Ansel Adams. But anyway, thank you so much. So. The uh, basically what, it, you know, to, to boil it down was uh, until a year ago, I was my 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 real estate photos were single flash layer period you know that was it so they had they had shadows and and i would even try using umbrellas here and there but those are really tricky especially when you're dealing with those big windows you know so i was trying to bounce off of wood and doing all this stuff and you know struggling with it and i never i never uh, i never uh there's a phenomenal photographer a friend of mine out here in the desert named lance gerber and he has had this dialed in for quite a while if you want to be inspired by some really nice architectural work uh check out Lance. And, uh, anyway, I'd seen his work, you know, it's a relatively small town I'm in. So we, we know each other, we see each other's work and, uh, you know, I saw his stuff and it just drove me nuts. You know, I'd see this bright, natural looking interior with this clear, nice window view with no reflections in it. And I would just curse his name. I mean, uh, he's a, he's a friend of mine, so I can say that uh, it, just remarkable. You know, it used to drive me nuts. How, how did you do that? Um, uh, we're buddies, but we're not good enough friends that I could hey, say, Hey man, how, how do you do that? <laughs> Cause we're both working the same small market, you know? And it was, uh, uh, when I, you know, met you and started watching your videos and learning how to blend ambience into the flash frames and gosh, you know, when I, when I'm working on, you know, just a couple layers on a luminosity mode, I still get excited about it. Watching those shadows melt away, you know, it, it, I still get mm. giddy watching it. Um, so anyway, uh, the, that took my work up to the, you know, up to near where I'm at now. And, and I, I took off with it. Not only did my work improve, but I, I enjoyed it a lot more that I enjoyed the results a lot more. Um, even the post-processing process, just that, you know, blending layers to make the magic happen is, is exciting. I love it. Mm-hmm. Well, what I think, Chris, works for you, and you know, I've seen a lot of your work. I've been following your work for some time on Instagram and whatnot since we first. I think we first met maybe about a year ago when you were starting to get into video, and we were we were speaking for a little bit about that. I don't I don't remember what was it, a year ago, maybe less, maybe more. Yeah. I don't know. But um, whatever the case is, the your style, your lighting style, and your style perfectly complements the type of properties you're shooting. Um, and I think that's very important that a lot of people neglect is, you know, they just learn how to do, um, you know, flash and ambient mixture and don't get their style to work perfectly with the types of properties. And, you know, you have very big open spaces furnished beautifully, very modern places, and that perfectly complements the way you shoot. And that's why your work looks the way it does. Well, it certainly helps having the type of properties that we have out here yes. to shoot. Yes, I it mean, does. I mean, I think I, I take some uh, unjust credit for that, you know, like, wow, that's mm-hmm. an amazing picture. I used to say that about the golf course images, you know, I, I developed landscape photography techniques using graduated neutral densities and whatever, all that stuff that landscape photographers do. And I had that all dialed in shooting at the right time of light and all that. But you know, like, Oh my gosh, that's the most remarkable picture. You used to do such great work. And like, I didn't really, I didn't do that. You know, this, I just took a picture of it. And I kind of feel that way about the homes, although obviously there's more to it than that. But yeah, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to photograph the, the homes that I shoot. Oh, well, I'm not saying lucky. There's a difference between lucky and fortunate, but certainly fortunate. 
I, I would like to, to throw in, though, that something everybody listening should understand that it, it, it is really so much to do, Chris, about the properties you're photographing. When I have a unbelievably beautiful property with the lighting, interior lighting is just made on dimmers and beautiful. The staging's beautiful. The, the landscape's beautiful. Everything's beautiful. It's not the same as going out and shooting day-to-day -day, uh, real estate, although that's your day to that appears to be your day-to-day -day real estate. But no, I will it's say, not. Well, I'll, we'll get into that in a little okay. bit. <laughs> well, you don't show it. so. But I will say that I want people out there to know that it, it isn't the same and it, you might get a uh, property that's not great an empty property and a piece of uh, something I won't even mention but you know what it's all part of it and it's all your job to make it look as good as it can but don't try to compare the photos you see on on your website Chris uh, or Brian or even some of mine although I try to show <laughs> I'm happy to show some of the not so great um, listings but please understand that a lot of this is don't expect to get the same quality no matter how great you light it how great you shoot it it's still you're, you're dependent upon um, your your subject it's like having a beautiful model as opposed to a very uh, less than desirable and slightly overweight <laughs> model so you know I'll go. I'll just leave it at that. I'll take a lovely picture of a beautiful woman. <laughs> I can only do so much, Chris. I can only do so much. <laughs> yeah. So listen, I want to ask you um, that we're getting into this. I know that one thing I really want to touch upon is your use of outsourcing. So I will premise it by saying I know for a fact, because I've asked Chris before, you do outsource a lot of your images and you have a certain look to your photography. I will say that. I think if anybody looks at your work and okay, granted, most of the stuff I've been looking at is very beautiful homes with beautiful views, with crystal clear skies because you're in the desert. And uh, what, what can you say about outsourcing? What led you to begin, begin to do outsourcing? And where are you at? And how would one choose an outsourcer at this time of, of their career? Yeah, I, I got to it, uh, fortunately, because I got frankly too busy to do any of the post processing i mean the downside to doing the uh you know flash ambient exposure blending is that it's relatively flambient, flambient say it are we saying it now all right <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh it's it's much more time consuming than what i was doing previously you know the single flash flame single flash frames uh there's a lot more to it you know i never used to even pull a real estate image into Photoshop, much less have multiple layers, four or five layers. Good night. You know, I don't have time for that. Um, so when I started putting out my new, you know, my post rich work, um, uh, people noticed my local clients noticed, uh, social media has been really, really good to me. Uh, and that has a lot to do with the fact that, uh, I'm in a fairly unique market in a few different ways, but one of them is it's a, it's a relatively small town. I mean, there's a quarter of a million people in the desert, which is not a small town, but it's, it's no, uh, Manhattan. You know what I mean? Um, so everybody kind of knows everybody and, and everybody kind of knows me on, on Facebook and Instagram. And that's because I built a social media following over a number of years, you know, for that, not that specific purpose, but for the purpose of promoting my business. Um, and so that work started getting out there and, uh, my, the real estate portion of my business started taking off. And I was so happy about that because I'd actually rather shoot real estate than anything else other than maybe golf courses. Um, so anyway, this started happening and I also have a family. I have three small kids a uh, beautiful wife and my that's all I do is hang out with them I mean I work and I come home to be with my wife and kids that's it that's that's all I'm about and when I started you know getting 
four shoots a day, like on a, on a daily basis. That happened to me occasionally in the past, like a really, you know, peak moment and peak season. I might get uh, three or four shoots a day, maybe a couple, three days in a row. But then I would have to take a day or two off even to edit, you know, single layers. Uh, and uh, I saw that happening. And uh, it happened quickly, you know, to where I was looking at either taking a day off or two to catch up on editing or like shooting every other day, basically. Uh, that either or not sleep at all and not see my kids at all, which ain't happening. Um, so there really wasn't any other choice you know if i want to grow my business and be as successful as possible the the time spent in front of the computer is uh money wasted money is time and you don't make money sitting in the front of the computer i make money going out and shooting booking jobs and booking more jobs so uh having someone to do that layer work for me uh, allows me to shoot more and make more money and spend more time with my family and those are two of my favorite things to do so it's a no-brainer and well, I was going to say, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And, you know, you get to that point, you know, hopefully everyone gets to that point in their business where the only way to start scaling up, I mean, we make money when we shoot. Um, like you just said it yourself, we don't make money when we sit at a computer. And you get to that point where the only way to scale up at that point is to start outsourcing your work. Um, you know, I outsource a good portion of my work, not everything yet. It depends on the client, depends on the type of job, um, you know, it depends on the contract, um, because I still trust my editing over an outsourcers. Although, um, you know, it's good to fine tune, um, your outsourcer to kind of deliver what you like to do. And, you know, if you're outsourcing all your, your still work, I guess you did that cause your work looks incredible. Um, but yeah, I mean, you get to that point where that's where, you know, you decide, do I want to scale up and do I want to start shooting more and more and stop spending those days in front of the computer? And, you know, the, t like you said, the time spent at a computer editing, you're, you're better off for your business going out and marketing yourself and speaking to new realtors or speaking to new designers or new architects, whatever you do, whatever type of photography you do and, and getting your business out there because in the long run, that's going to bring you more money. Um, sitting at the computer will not. So. And I, uh, also I, I had come from, uh, in the, the, just in, in, uh, in the post rich portion of my career a couple of years ago, I was doing a lot of commercial work, uh, shooting for, uh, a few ad agencies and um, it's common for in working with agencies you know to deliver raw files like uh, I don't I don't do the post on a lot of the commercial work I do um, and so I was already you know comfortable with I know some people say oh, I don't want to you know I can't give away the you know that the part that part of that creative process but um, for I've been doing that for years. The, I do a lot of work with music festivals, and those are you know we're handing in raw files, and if they're going to a team of editors that are working magic on them that that I'm not even capable of. And I'd say the same is true for editors. I mean, it's hard to find it's hard to find a really good editor, but the good editors are definitely better at it than I am because that's what they do for a living. I'd rather take pictures. Well, give me an example of someone out there who are, there are, are a lot of people out there listening. How do you go about finding an editor, Chris? What do you do? There's a, a group on Facebook, uh, re real estate photography, real estate outsourcing or yeah, something repo, like that. Yeah. And, uh, there's hundreds of them on there. Most of them are overseas. And just from my, uh, activity in, uh, media, social media, and in the industry, I, I, I still get offers almost every day. You know, people asking, you know, Hey, you need an editor. Uh, so anyway, I get five, of the, I get five of those emails a day. I don't know if you <laughs> yeah, guys do also, I literally get five how do you a day. Pick, how do you choose the one? What made you go with what you went with? That's a good question. So what I did was, uh, I had, I, I still remember it. Well, I shot a really tricky house and it was, I think it was right before I came to your workshop last year, Rich. And, um, it was a, a brutal house to shoot super dark, you know, this dungeness wood and orange paint interior with this picture window view that was like, you know, 
12 feet tall and uh this large space too i mean uh the main living area was uh vast and dark and i shot it as best i could i think i had i might have been using pro photo b2s at the time i think i had three or four you know pro photo b2s all around the uh you know trying to bounce off of different stuff it was about rough. six thousand dollars there right yeah and and <laughs> i i picked i had about you know say like four or five frames or layers of each image and i and i had three images so i put i put in a dropbox uh like 15 or 20 raw files of three or four shots and i uh had been you know keeping my eye on collecting uh contacts uh for editors and i i kind of put out a contest so you know you uh you want to be my editor here is a house that i just shot there's three images here show me what you can do and i got back uh uh, I said, and I want to know, you know, the cost and your typical turnaround time. And I want to see your work on this. And it's one thing for an editor to show you a picture that he already did. Uh, it's another thing to show them what mm. they can do on your own work. So I, I, I had a little contest, you know, to earn the job as my editor. And um, one company stood out. Uh, it was this company from India. I'm not going to share their name uh, for a couple reasons. I, I like them, but there are a lot of outsourcing companies out there that are you know kind of uh post-processing factories and the problem with those y'all hear about i'm sure if you haven't spirit experienced it firsthand is you can get a good editor at, at mm -hmm. a company and then the next assignment you send them will go to maybe a junior editor or whatever but the consistency is a major issue going with those companies. Uh, and so I worked with that company and kind of like, okay, you know, I need to work with whoever it was that did that job. That's who I want editing my pictures. Whoever did this last job, I do not want them editing my pictures. Like, okay. And they try to accommodate. Um, but anyway, that was kind of tough going. Um, and so I continued that process gradually and until I found a couple of, uh, freelance independent editors, and they're they're overseas, uh, but it's a person that I'm working with, you know, not a, not a company, and that's been key for me. The problem with that is uh, turnaround time isn't what it is with a, a company. Um, you know, working with an overseas company, I can usually uh, give them a job at night, and it's in my inbox when I wake up the next morning. Um, maybe not so much with uh, a freelance independent, uh, you know, one person. Uh, if I'm sending them four jobs a day to edit, I, I don't expect them to have it back to me in a day. That's why I have a 48-hour turnaround instead of a 24-hour like a lot of people because I need the quality to be there. You know, you wait, wait one more day to get it right. And then one more thing I'll say about that, even the best editors that I've tried, and there's been a, a number of them, I've never been happy with the results that I get back. Uh, as they are. I always spend a, a fairly decent amount of time uh, in post again on the JPEGs that they send me, um, you know, just brushing, you know, little color casts and working on contrast and usually taking the saturation down. Um, frankly, you know, they're a little, little overworked. <laughs> you know, but I think that's everyone we've spoken to in all our episodes that outsources has said the same thing. And I think that's just part of the workflow, even when you outsource is that you have to come in at the end and just, you know, and there's a, there's a great disappointment to people that try that, you know, that give it a shot. Like, yeah, I, I, uh, I sent some files to that editor you recommended and they came back looking like a freaking cartoon i'm like what well, did you try taking the saturation down on them then maybe i don't know uh but yeah they it, it, the best editors even still need work and, and more importantly i think i mean a lot of the times i get work back that's good enough for the kind of bread and butter you know single family uh regular type houses i shoot you know but i want to i, I want to give them my look i kind of have a and it's not a a formula per se it's just this idea that i have in my head of this uh you know this consistent look that i want to give that's why i like working with one editor and then i have a process that i go through after i get the images back from my editor you know the putting the putting the me in them well chris i will say that 
I can, there's a few people in the groups or people that I know, photographers I know that I will say, I can look at your images, I can look at images and go, those look like Chris's images. There's a few other photographers, which will I will not want name, will not name, but I think that that is really a uh, a really great tribute to your look is just so great, and that's it's plan, not for man. everybody. Yeah, that's the plan, but it's not for everybody. But if it's for you, you know, I, I want all our listeners to know that you can pick the look you want you can give the appearance you want you can do anything you want in your business you just got to set it up right yeah yeah i mean i think uh individuality i mean how how terrible would it be if all of our work looked the same i I love the fact that (laughs) you know there's we can see a difference i saw in the discussion group uh on facebook today you know somebody saying why you know where are the shadows why why does everybody have to do these big bright images and the you know what do you care you know you like shadows and you like dark then do shadows and dark man you know Touché. Like that's, that's yeah. cool for instagram what do you th- knock it what out. do you think brian are you are you more of a of a shadow guy or more of a, a bright guy what do you do I'm more of a shadow guy. It's funny, you know, we're talking about outsourcing and and having to do your own tweaks to it. So I outsource a lot of my images too. um, And some of my videos too. I want to, you know, I want to publicly thank Chris because I do a lot of drone videos, as I've mentioned. And when I was getting to the point where I couldn't edit my drone videos anymore and I needed to look for an outsourcer, the way I found out my outsourcer was I emailed Chris probably about three, four months ago. And I said, your videos look awesome. Who's editing them for you? Um, it's so not me, that's Chris for sure. The guy, uh, yes. <laughs> so uh, Chris gave me the guy's info and he's been editing some of my drone videos up, up until as recently as yesterday. So uh, thank you, Chris, for that. Um, his videos are good. But when Just don't I, keep um, my guy too busy. I, I've, I've got some more friends to do too. <laughs> Hey, I don't know if he's the same one that's doing photos for you, no. but his, his videos his videos look good. So, um, but nevertheless, um, yeah, when I get my photos back from my photo editor, you know, he also he takes the shadows up too high, and I have to, that's that's part of my process of fixing up his images is just dropping the shadows back, uh, shadow slider to the left, I guess you can call it in Lightroom, and bringing those shadows back in. Um, so. You know, I like shadows, I like contrast, and you just like, you know, we were speaking about, you have to find what works for you. And, you know, if you do outsource your stuff, you know, just figure out how to fine tune what they're delivering to you to match your style. It's kind of like, I don't know, I don't know what's, what's up with me and analogies today, but it's kind of like, you know, if you're, <laughs> if you're baking, you know, it's a process of the ingredients and the baking and putting it together and all that. And, and then the decorating, I kind of feel like the, you know, shooting it and then having somebody else put the layers together is that's kind of like he's my sous chef you know and then and then he hands me the plate uh and then i i garnish it and and, and well put fix it up before yeah. it goes out to the table you know well it's gotta, put, look, gotta look like mine but I, I don't need to do all the work you know let, let somebody else do that awesome. <laughs> somebody else need the dough listen chris i want to i want to we're kind of going to have to wind this down a little bit but i would like for you to um Tell us how any kind of recipe, as we're on sous chefs, any kind of recipe you would have for somebody kind of that thinks they've got their act together and wants to really get going and better uh, properties, better clients, better product, blah, blah, blah. What do you what do you recommend to people? The most important thing is to have a portfolio Um, and it's got to it's it's got to be right um i know that uh shooting model homes was a great way uh early for me to kind of hone this and and build my portfolio um and the great thing about shooting model homes is they're staged you know they look just right and they're they're happy to get you know the the sales office there is usually very happy to get photos uh, that's a great way to build a portfolio. And then once you have a decent set of images that you can share to promote your work, I'm, I really favor, uh, what I call, you know, grassroots marketing, uh, going out and meeting people. You know, it's, it's so important. Realtors are by nature, 
people people they're sales people you know they love to talk the game uh they they get the talk of the game and unfortunately uh the stereotypical photographer may be kind of like the artsy introvert type and it may not be the right personality type to go out and and get work and that's a tricky thing about it i mean if you're a freelance person you're not just a photographer an artist you're also the sales manager uh you're the marketing director you know you got to do those things if you want to be successful but the point is uh you know, just get out there and talk to people. Go to, you know, just do an internet search on who's the, who's the who your local agents, uh, potential clients, and give them a call. You know, ask them if you can come and talk to them and show them your work, and then offer them something that they don't have. Um, hopefully, better quality, maybe better price, um, but just get out there, shoot, talk. Just got to get out there. Excellent. Well, what we've said before is you don't have to offer everything at once. You don't have to offer better quality and better price and faster turnaround um, than everyone else because then you're setting yourself up. But just you know, if if you know if they're using somebody who gives a three day turnaround, offer them one day turnaround. But you might be priced the same or quality might be the same, but they're still going to use you because at least you're offering something that's a little bit better. I mean, if you want to try to completely blow them out of the water, then like you said, you know. Better, quali- better quality should, shouldn't be an issue. You should always strive to be better than you know, your competitors, I guess, but, if you want to call but it that But there way. is something that I would, I've actually been wondering about is um, how do you ask them uh, what they're lacking, what they would like? How do you do that, Chris? What do you do? I think you got to be, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's being direct and upfront mm-hmm. and yeah. And honest and real, you know, um, you know, what do you need? Uh, what, what's lacking in your, in the marketing of your property in terms of images or video? Um, do you think I could help you sell it better? Well put. Yeah. And one, one other thing is I've, uh, I've come to this conclusion, uh, fairly recently is that, and this is from working with a few really good agents out here in the desert, these most successful agents, they don't see the f- great photography as much as a means to sell the house as it is to uh, build their brand, you know? Exactly, I, exactly. You see, you know, you go look at a photographer's website and look at their listings, and if you see cell phone pics, if you're selling a house, I'm not going to hire that agent. Look at his listings. They look like he, he uh, took the pictures with the cell phone. Yeah. You know, you go on an agent's page and they've got all these clean, crisp photos. You go, man, this guy or girl, you know, they got it going on. It it, it, it precedes their reputation. The f- social media, internet, sales and marketing. People shop for homes on the internet. People shop for realtors on the internet. I think basically that may be a better way to sum it up. People aren't just shopping for homes on the internet they're looking for uh their agent and if they see crappy pictures they're uh, i think they're going to move on so the the point being is you know i hate sales pitches but you know if you could find some way to work this into not sounding so pitchy is you know the photos represent you and your brand it's it's not about selling a house it's not about making a sale it's about demonstrating and proving to your clients and and more importantly your potential future clients that you're going to give them the best possible service and experience of selling their home and good pictures are a number one way to do that in my opinion word chris word Word. man you are you nailed it I, i want to tell all our listeners it's all about branding and just have your brand on a product and it can be your brand or your agent's brand or whoever's brand but that's about it absolutely 100 percent. yes sir and speaking of video we didn't even talk about video yet is that gonna have to be part two uh, no, Chris, let's dive into that now quickly for a couple of minutes because I know people want to hear it and I know video is up and coming. So I know, um, like I mentioned briefly before, we, we spoke, I guess it was around a year ago when you started getting into video and your video has come a long way very quickly and it seems like you're doing it on all your properties. So 
Tell me how you had such a quick progression and how your work is looking the way it did and how you, I guess, picked it up so quickly and how you market it. Tell me everything, everything about your last, I guess, year or so transitioning to video. Sure. It was, um, a a lot of it had to do with uh, the discovery of outsourcing. I mean, I've always known that video is, is a thing and that I needed to do it. I have a friend here in town who's a great videographer. He doesn't particularly like filming real estate, but when I had a client that asked for it, you know, he would usually do it, or at least I had somebody that I could refer it out to. But more and more, a few of my best clients started asking me for it more and more. And it kind of reminded me of the aerial thing that happened uh, a few years ago. You know, I started, my best clients started saying, hey, this is, I need this. You know, if you, if you can't provide this to me, I'm going to find somebody else that will. And uh, it's kind of like, you know, with the aerial thing, I got drug into that kicking and screaming. I saw it as like a necessary evil, like, oh, it's, it's just another thing I've got to do, another thing I've got to learn, another thing I've got to buy, another thing I've got to charge. Um, and, and then what happened with the aerial was that I, I discovered that I really liked it. You know, uh, I really like shooting with it. And same thing with video. I was like, ah, oh, this, I oh got, I got to do this. I'm just going to have to do this. I'm leaving money on the table. If I don't do it, my clients are asking me about it, asking me for it. And the whole thing with video is I knew that I didn't like editing it. I don't really know how to edit video. And I know that I don't really ever want to. I certainly don't have time for it. I mean, maybe, uh, if my kids were gone, you know, maybe it might be fun to do something to do in the off season, but I, I don't have time for it and I don't want to do it. So anyway, I discovered the uh, outsourcing the end. Maybe I can find somebody that can edit my videos as well. And then, um, I made buddies with a guy in San Diego. His name's, uh, Brady Spear, Spearhead Media. If you want to see great real estate video, check out Spearhead Media. And Brady and I became buddies, um, he uh, was doing some video work that needed stills, and I was doing some stills work that needed video. So uh, we kind of uh, we'd help each other out, and he uh, he took it a step further out of the kindness and goodness of his heart to basically show me what he could and teach me what he knew. He lives a couple hours away in San Diego, so we didn't get to see each other very much, but um, we coordinated. He helped me figure out what to buy, what kind of cameras to buy. Uh, the, uh, video is a whole new world for me. And I love that about it too. The, I love the learning process, not just the researching which gear and which camera profiles and LUTs and all that stuff, uh, the the gear and everything. And he really took me under his wing and taught, told me what to buy and how to shoot. And he really gave me a good foothold. And then what happened was I always thought video was kind of like just, there was this just documentary, you know? And then, uh, I started watching some really good real estate videos and seeing those cinematic qualities, what kind of moves. And Brady talks about that, you know, like pivot points and focal points and, uh, ways to create interest with motion, kind of the way that I'm used to seeing a still photograph using light to create interest. It's using motion to create interest. It's a whole another thing. Um, and I just got turned on by it and, and love it, love it. It's so much fun. And I'm doing a video now on probably half of the properties I shoot. Um, I'll shoot stills and then I'll do a, a little 60 second video on top. It's a little upsell thing that I have. And it's been phenomenal. Double doubling your income, not quite doubling, but sort of. I, near, I nearly did. Yeah. Nearly oh, did. that is so great. And you know what? You you touched on a really great point that they're going to ask you for it, and if you can't provide it, they're going to go to somebody else. So you either have to do it or you have to outsource it. And I'm not one to oppose outsourcing. So I think one or the other, you got to do it. Yeah, you're awesome. you're at worst, you know, going to lose the client. Uh, yep. And at best, you're leaving money on the table. That's for sure. Yeah. A uh, good bit of money. So um, fortunately, I've found that I really enjoy shooting it. And um, maybe someday I'll learn how to edit it. But I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't see that happen. And I'm hanging out with my kids after work now. Well, I was about to say, you know what? If you're making money outsourcing it, then keep, you know, keep on going. Why change? Okay. Well, that is so 
What a wonderful interview. Thank you so much, Chris Miller. Um, I think uh, we've touched upon some really great, great uh, subjects and information. And uh, this has really been wonderful. And uh, I think, Brian, you, you've you got a lot of your, the video in your blood and a lot of the things you've got going on for you. So I'd just like you to please take us out of this because I know we're running out of time. Yeah, sure. So, Chris, before we uh, close out, just if you can, just give everyone your website again so they can find you. And can they view some of your video work on your website as well? Or do you have a Vimeo page? Yeah, or Vimeo. Um, um, uh, Vimeo.com slash Imagine Imagery and uh, Instagram Imagine Imagery. I M A G I N E I M A G E R Y. Wait, uh, how do you spell that? <laughs> Imagine imagery on <laughs> Vimeo and Instagram. Yeah, awesome. So, Chris, thank you very much for coming on. I know we'll speak. We speak every so often, so I know we'll speak soon. Um, but it was great uh, hearing about your uh, your history and your progression and how you uh, grew f- from, uh, I guess, where you started to where you are now, f- you know, via Rich's workshop. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> You know your work is great, so just keep on keep on. Yeah, it's an honor and a pleasure. I love talking to y'all always, and it's uh, really cool to be on on your podcast. Thanks a bunch. Oh yeah, Chris, I'll just take us out just saying no. Really, the honor is mine and and, and ours because you really uh, uh, you are the epitome of where I think people want to go. And and granted, you just happen to have a clientele that has incredible listings, so that's a big part of it. But well, you post really the ugly ones, Rich. <laughs> Why would I do that? I can't even go there, but I I just want to, let me get back on track, Chris. I just want to say, man, you really have done some great work. You have been coming up and you incorporated other resources to increase your value and what you can, can offer for your clients. And I think that that is what we're all about. And, uh, you know, I just think go with what you're, what you're feeling and, and, try to incorporate what you dream about if you want to do video learn about video and do it and and so on so i want to thank you so much chris and uh i would i would say your website but i can't remember imagine (laughs) imagery oh wait how do you spell that no i think it's great but um (laughs) Listen, um, I want to say thank you so much from Shooting Spaces, a real estate photography podcast. Don't forget about uh, just please give us a thumbs up and uh, subscribe to our podcast. And uh, really, we have this offering of um, uh, Ask the Guys so you can ask questions and we'll answer them. And uh, I'll let Brian take us out. I think you kind of covered it all, Rich. (laughs) I think so. All right. See you next time. Okay. See you later, guys. This has been Shooting Spaces, a real estate photography podcast. Subscribe to this show and don't forget to leave us a review. You can also follow Rich and Brian on social media and at their website, shootingspacespodcast.com.